The question why someone would want to be the ruler of a given world, let alone say 20 or 30, does not always allow for a sensible answer. I mean, just think of the constant perils involved. Crimes against the state, fanatical extremists, the unruly populace's betrayal at court, revolts in the army, invasions by a foreign government, tax riots, pirates, rebellions. God, I love it so. The planet taken off, situated as the third celestial body in system, was initially colonized in 2177 during the first exodus from Terra. Positioned approximately 122.7 light years southeast of Seoul, its early settlers hailed predominantly from Central Asia and East Asia. So we're talking about like the Stan countries like the Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and for East Asia, Mongolia, maybe China mostly, since uh, how modern capella society is. Also maybe some Siberian and maybe East Russians mixed in there. They bestowed upon their new home the name of the last silver premier, Oleg Tikhonov, honoring his legacy. So a side note, in the Baltic universe, right, the USSR was reformed in 1997 after like a coup or something. And they existed up until like the mid-2010s, the mid uh, 2010s, where they had a civil war. And then NATO intervened and disbanded everything. The settlers initially landed on what is now the capital city of Tekograd, establishing their new lives on this alien world they call home. Over time, additional cities sprang up and industries flourished, transforming the planet into a vital hub for further colonization endeavors. Its rapid development and strategic location made it a crucial world within that region of space. In modern times, the Tikhonov system serves as a formidable fortress system for the Capellan Confederation acting as a bulwark against potential threats from the Federate Suns to Putin's combine. While technically every system falls under the governance of the Terran Alliance, many systems eventually evolve into quasi-states with their own governments. Tikhonov is no exception. Positioned centrally and boasting advanced development, neighboring colonized systems began to regard Tikhonov as a regional leader. They unite in a loose federation known as the Tikhonov Union. With the establishment of this federation, the inhabitants of these systems gradually felt less connected to the Terran Alliance, the de facto human government of the era. Fearing potential efforts by the Terran Alliance to tighten control over their nation, or the expansionist ambitions of neighboring protostates, the Tikhonov Union forged a defensive pact with a neighboring entity, the Chesterton Trade Worlds. Together, they collaborated to establish a buffer zone between their territories and external states, aiming to safeguard their sovereignty and security. The defensive pact proved effective, successfully repelling incursions from neighboring states and pirates. However, in 2202, escalating border clashes prompted the grant of additional powers to select members of the Tikhonov Defense Force, notably entities like the Karinas family. Founders of the Tikhonov Earthworks Limited Industrial Complex received these augmented authorities. Instead of merely restructuring the military, the Karinas family leveraged their influence to reorganize the entire union. They divided it into three provinces. Tikhonov, Chesterton, and Hamal, and instituted a tetrarchy governed by a council of four. Over the next two decades, they not only fortified their borders but also expanded them, annexing systems like Algol, Rio, Marak, Taibalt, and Rukhba from the Terran Alliance. Now, it's not exactly detailed how this council works, but I think it's safe to assume that the Karinas family holds like the, the big boss position, you know, he's like the top guy. While the rest basically handles like each province, the, you know, there's three, three of them left, and there's three provinces, so they probably handle those. By the mid 23rd century, the Union, now known as the Grand Union, had solidified its position as a significant power. Meanwhile, the Terran Alliance's announcement of the Demarcation Declaration reshaped the political landscape. This declaration effectively severed ties with systems located beyond 30 light years from Terra, leaving them to navigate their own governance and defense. Despite this, the Grand Union flourished, expanding to encompass at least 24 systems. However, tensions simmered as border disputes arose between the Grand Union and the Marlet Association over four systems, Marak, Mira, Mesertim, and Almak. Both entities laid claim to these contested territories. Ultimately, the Marlet Association emerged victorious, successfully occupying these disputed systems. Internally, the Grand Union faced significant challenges. 
The hereditary nature of the tetrarch position posed a dilemma as Anton Karanis, the incumbent tetrarch, found himself without a direct heir. With his wife and child tragically lost during childbirth, the line of succession was in jeopardy. At 74 years old, Anton recognized the looming threat of civil unrest should he pass without a clear successor. In a bold move to secure stability, Anton opted to adopt an heir into his family. His choice fell upon General Diana Chin, a seasoned leader renowned for her command of the 3rd Tikhonov Border Guard. Diana's strategic acumen and experience in the tikhonov marlette border conflicts made her a fitting candidate to inherit Anton's responsibilities. With tensions escalating and the prospect of reclaiming lost territories looming, Anton saw in Diana the potential to lead the Grand Union forward. In the quarters following the final battle for the factory complexes, General Chin had the table laid out to receive her command staff as soon as they reported in. She sat down to the meal alone and waited in silence for the first of her comrades to arrive. As time went on, I noticed that whenever the door to a tent opened, admitting a page or orderly, the general would glance at it eagerly, as if through some magical means her anticipation would make her officers appear. In the end, she waited for over two hours, and her meal still uneaten retired for the night. That evening, the general slept on a wood pallet on the ground outside. An officer of the third grenadiers was busy dying in a general's bed. On October 11th, 2308, General Chin initiated a bold offensive. Leading the third Tikhonov border guards across the Marlet Association border and swiftly advancing towards the Almak system. Unbeknownst to many, this invasion was secretly funded by the Sarnas supremacy, aimed at keeping Tikhonov entangled in their own conflict while the Sarns fight the Capellans. The sudden assault caught the Marlets off guard allowing Tikhonov forces to swiftly occupy the Almak system by the end of November, followed by Mesertim in the next month and Halloran V shortly after. The lack of cohesion and unity among Marlet military leaders further exacerbated their defense capabilities, enabling the Tikhonovans to seize an additional eight systems virtually unopposed. However, the triumph was short-lived. In a tragic turn of events, General Chin mysteriously perished in May 2309 while the forces were in the midst of invading the Myra system. Her untimely death sent shockwaves through the Tikhonovan ranks, shattering morale and prompting a strategic withdrawal from Myra. Although hostilities ceased after this event, no formal peace accord was ever broken between the two states, leaving lingering tensions unresolved. I tried to go to work today. The transport was late. Someone had bombed the controller's post last night, and they were still getting things sorted out. Turned out it really didn't matter, though. When I got to work, the factory gates were shut. The whole plant was shut tight. They said they didn't have enough power to stay open for more than two days a week now. And would I please come back next week? They said that there was enough power because there wasn't enough coal. And there wasn't enough coal because the miners are out on strike. I tried stopping by the grocery before heading back. No one's making deliveries anymore, and there's a shortage of paper bags, and so all I carry home is what I can hold in my hands. Halfway home, the transport was grounded. Someone hit the power grid, and so I end up walking the last two miles with a can of beans and a tube of toothpaste. So much for dinner. Something's got to give. In the aftermath of the conflict, the Tikhonov Grand Union persevered, maintaining its formidable presence and its influence in the region. It played a pivotal role in brokering peace negotiations between the Sarns and the Capellans, a testament to its diplomatic prowess and standing as one of the most prosperous states within the Capellan region. These talks culminated with the establishment of the Capellan Commonality, a loose federation encompassing all Capellan states. While each state may have their own style of governance, they are allowed to send their own candidates to run for premiership of their commonality. However, in 2310, the passing of Anton Karanis left a void in leadership, sparking uncertainty over succession. Despite this, the Romanian tetrarchs opted to uphold the existing governance structure rather than instigating reforms or succession protocols. Surprisingly, this decision averted the threat of civil war. Instead, they implemented numerous governmental departments to oversee various state affairs. While this measure prevented internal strife, the proliferation of bureaucratic red tape hampered the efficiency of governance. 
Nonetheless, the Grand Union demonstrated its resilience by successfully navigating through a three-year conflict, the Federated Sons in 3118. The incompetence of the Tetrarchs became increasingly evident as they lacked a fundamental understanding of economic principles. Fueled by a misplaced sense of prosperity, they indulged in lavish spendings on numerous projects, each attempting to outdo the other. This reckless expenditure spiraled into rampant inflation, soaring unemployment rates, and exorbitant living costs, plunging the populace into hardship. Between 2336 and 2351, the discontentment simmering among the population erupted in over 300 riots across the Grand Union. In response, border guards were redeployed to quell the unrest, further stretching the already strained resources of this nation. Amidst this internal turmoil, the Grand Union faced external threats as well. The Federated Sons seized the opportunity to exploit the weakened state of border systems, launching invasions into key territories such as Myra, Mesherton, and Almak. Faced with the imminent threat of military defeat, the Grand Union was compelled to capitulate, signing the Akala and Almak Accords, which recognized Davion's gains on the Chesterton province. However, the challenges did not end there. The Sarna supremacy capitalized on the chaos launching invasions to Algol and Slocum, further destabilizing the already precarious situation within the Grand Union. In November 2352, Capellan Prime Minister Sarah Palmer made a significant diplomatic stride by brokering a ceasefire and initiating peace talks between the Tikhonovans and Sarns. Despite her efforts, the negotiation prolonged for years without reaching a resolution. Unfortunately, Palmer's tenure concluded before consensus could be achieved, leaving the delicate peace process hanging in the balance. In 2357, the Federated Sun seized the opportunity presented by the weakened state of Sarna supremacy and launched a sudden invasion. Their swift assault resulted in the capture of the Bell System. Surprisingly, this act of aggression served as a catalyst for unity among the previous divided states. Recognizing the need for collective action, the Capellans, Tikhonovans, and Sarns formed a joint military force to mount a counterattack and reclaim the Bell System. However, upon arrival, they were met with a perplexing sight. Their entire system was devoid of any trace of human presence. Both invaders and defenders, along with the civilian population of 15,000, had vanished without a trace, leaving behind an unresolved mystery that puzzled investigators for years to come. Concerning the intentiveness of two cases of little tax agency, the campaign, there is a popular story of the noble woman from Kansu who wished to end an unhappy marriage. Being browbeaten by a husband who refused a divorce and by a mother-in-law who threatened to take back the wedding presents, in desperation, the woman appealed to Prime Minister Tukas, who sent her along to the director of the campaign. After hearing her out, the director ruled in the woman's favor. She was free to divorce her husband, should she wish, and could keep her expensive wedding presents. If only to enable her to pay the substantial divorce tax, the director had just then decided it should be implemented immediately. In 2358, Seluk Tukas ascended to the position of Capellan Prime Minister, bringing with him a fervent pro-Capellan ideology aimed at regional unification. His vision mirrored Japan's Asia for Asians campaign during World War II, advocating for a united front against external threats. Tukas orchestrated a resolution to prolong peace talks between Tekhanov and Sarna, leaning favorably towards Sarna's interests. As a result, Azha, Slocum, and Algol systems were ceded. To offset the losses incurred by Tikhonov, Tukas orchestrated the secret Hansen Convention with the Grand Union. This agreement pledged support from the Capellan commonality to the Grand Union in the event of an anti-Davion campaign by the year 2365. Tukas's private council sessions often begin at 9 at night. Until then, Tukas is busy with the affairs of the day. Once begun, they generally last until 4 or 5 in the morning. Tukas's advisors invariably fall asleep. The Commonality Director for Defense has the largest snore of all. At such times, the Prime Minister invariably reacts by kicking the chair from underneath the sleeping official, exclaiming, Do you keep awake, gentlemen? It's only three in the morning. Try and earn your salaries for a change. In 2363, the Grand Union, emboldened by its growing strength, took decisive action by renouncing the Almak and Akela Accords and demanding the return of Chesterton territories lost in previous conflicts. Prime Minister Tuka has openly backed this demand, fulfilling his commitment to support the Grand Union's objectives. However, tensions escalated further in May of the same year when a Capellan ambassador's ship tragically exploded, resulting in the loss of all aboard. Although no direct evidence implicated the Davions, 
Fuqua sees upon this incident as a pretext for war. The Grand Union, along the Capellan Commonality and St. Ives, initiated a coordinate invasion into Davion space, targeting the Lee system. To their dismay, the invading forces encountered fierce resistance from the well-prepared Federated Sons, who swiftly repelled the assault. It became evident that the Davions had received advance warning of the impending invasion. Speculation arose that the Sarns may have covertly tipped off the Davions, complicating the already volatile situation. Within two hours of setting down on the planet, we were attacked by hordes of enemy fighter craft that we've been told not to worry about. While the intelligence boys were trying to figure that one out, our CNC center was hit by Davion commandos, killing everybody inside. The top brass out of the way, everything after that just went from bad to worse. Around midday, a battalion of St. Ives armor got themselves cornered by Davion mechanized infantry in a box canyon. While we tried to relieve them, special Davion rocket armed tank killer teams worked their way with our comrades all afternoon. Night brought little relief from the troubles of the day. Davion had taken time to have every inch of the plateau we were regrouping on registered for artillery fire. Round about 1 a.m. they start pouring in on us, zeroed in by spotters with infrared gear. We never had a chance. The repercussions of the failed invasion and subsequent counteroffensive by the Federated Sons were severe. Davion forces swiftly seized control of key systems in St. Ives and Tikhonov, marking the first time in history that the Tikhonov system itself faced a siege. By the end of their advance, the Federated Sons effectively occupied all three states, plunging the region into chaos and uncertainty. Blame for the disastrous turn of events fell squarely on Prime Minister Seluk Tukas. His political opponent, Warren Aris, publicly condemned Tukas, calling for his immediate resignation. As tensions escalated within the Capellan commonality, the situation reached a boiling point when Tukas was assassinated in a bombing attack on his home, leaving no survivors. Subsequent elections to appoint a new Prime Minister were marred by controversy and scandal. Aris, initially favoured to win, faced opposition from the Federated Sons and the Free Worlds League, both of which covertly funded rival candidates to thwart his grand plans of a greater Capellan region. Revelations of electoral fraud sparked widespread outrage and disillusionment among the populace, leading to a drastic decline in voter turnout. Ultimately, the erosion of trust in the democratic process reached a critical juncture. With only a mere fraction of the population participating in the final election. As the Federated Sons intervened in the chaos engulfing the Capellan region, they deployed a peacekeeping force to Capella, ostensibly to maintain order until stable government could be established. However, suspicions ran high among the Capellan leaders, who feared the possibility of a complete takeover or the installation of a puppet regime by the Davions. In a pivotal emergency meeting, Duke Francis Lau proposed a radical solution the dissolution of the Capellan commonality and the formation of a single unified state. This proposal, while offering a potential end to the turmoil, also raised concerns by the erosion of democratic principles. Warren Aris, a staunch advocate for democracy, vehemently opposed Lao's plan and called for his immediate arrest. However, Lao's strategic advantage became apparent. His duchy of Lao had remained relatively unscathed by the recent conflicts both in terms of military losses and economic devastation. Leveraging this advantage, Lao issued an ultimatum to the other Capellan states. Accept his proposal for unification or face severe trade embargoes that would cripple their economies. Faced with limited options and the looming threat of economic collapse, the other Capellan states reluctantly agreed to Lao's terms. Thus, the era of an independent Tikhonov came to an end, giving rise to a new confederation under the leadership of Chancellor. Francis Lau.